Welcome, everyone. Today we are joined by the incredible survivor, Alyssa E. How are you, Alyssa? I'm well, Gabby. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Um, I connected with Alyssa recently and have read her incredible books on our life beyond MK Ultra and wow they're just so insightful and I, I was just chatting with Alyssa before and saying you know it's just such an incredible time for this information to be coming out because number one it's helping us all understand that it's no longer just happening to these targeted individuals or generational children from families so much of this technology is really being unleashed you know from the micro to the macro and onto the masses um, and Alyssa's book is just an incredible detail of you know your life experience but you know even more than that the deprogramming work that you've went through and I just think it's just so inspiring to read how you were able to, to actually go through that process mainly yourself um, which I thought was quite incredible like through that you know emotional insight and really you know being really honest I guess that would be quite challenging as well and Alyssa comes from a very high level programming you know, you've spoken about, you know, being um, involved with the military by religious groups, corporate groups. So, yeah, it's it's very fascinating, I think, for people, you know, we've kind of heard maybe about MK Ultra, but to actually go and see, you know, what a survivor of, you know, such high-level programming has had to work through in terms of deprogramming. So I would love to um, ask you, Alyssa, for people that you know, haven't connected with you before, to share um, some of your story and your incredible work with the books as well. Great, great, yeah. Um, I was born in 1962, so um, a friend of mine considers that to be a second generation model, is what she, we call it, which there are several generations beyond me now. Um, and um, I was taken through trauma-based mind control. Um, the the uh, trauma started in my family of origin. Uh, my father was a pedophile. And um, very early, I have some very early memories, uh, like at three years old, um, excuse me, six years old. Um, actually, there's earlier memories. There's, there's an infant memory that resurfaced. Um, I was pre-verbal so that I, my, my airway was being blocked to start the dissociation. Um, and then at six years old, I was already involved with some military, uh, naval, naval intelligence. Na the ONI, um, the naval intelligence is a big part of it. Most, most branches, all branches of the military have some aspect of this um, in the intelligence parts of their branches. Um, and, um, yeah, it kind of got started there and continued uh, well on through adolescence, teen years, um, into my 20s. I actually started what I call deep deprogramming, uh, meaning I met some people who could help me understand what was happening. They weren't deprogrammers. I, I personally don't believe in deprogrammers. Um, and uh, that was in my 40s, my mid 40s, and I was still being accessed and used at that point. And that went on for some years um, in early deprogramming. Um, I can say with much gratitude that it's been a long time since anyone's had access to me or been able to utilize me. And the process of trauma-based mind control is to create um, split personality alters. Um, it used to be called multiple personality disorder, but they now call it dissociative identity disorder. And I personally think that it was a, um, a way to make it not sound so bad, dissociative identity disorder, personally, that's mm -hmm. just my opinion. Um, it is split personalities, meaning that um, they can uh, program those splits when the mind splits through trauma, torture, a variety of things, they can program those different parts for different uh, personalities, different tasks that they perform. And there will be an amnesic wall from my front personality so that when those personalities take over the body, I have no memory of it. All I have is um, missing time and or um, in many cases I had physical aberrations that I awoke with mm. from the time that I was, um, you know, in an alternate personality. Um, there's tons of uses for, for one individual 
they rarely have one particular task, at least in my experience. And when, when we talk about high level, it means there seems to have been some um, high level people that had access to me and the use of me. So that's why I classify it as high level. Um, and I had several abilities in different altars, um, but my main purpose in my programming was um, sexual use and kill programming. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, throughout my life, I had what I call bleed through. Um, there would be moments of lucidity. Um, sometimes I was in a programming session or trauma torture session. Sometimes it was during an on task. I call them on task, meaning the altar has taken over and I'm going out and doing my programmers or controllers or handlers bidding. Um, and it's really interesting when I started deep deprogramming, a lot of those surfaced, many of those surfaced. It was almost as if I look at it this way, as if the highest part of me, the truest divine connected part of me had moments of lucidity and was recording and they were brief but was recording for many years later when I would begin to wake up and be able to make sense of all these things. Um, and then, like I said, I, I probably spent 12, 15 years trying to find out what was going on with me um, in my 30s and early 40s uh, without much success. Um, everything would seem dangerous because there had been police and there'd been uh, military and intelligence and, you know, all these things in my memory. So, and even mental health, it just didn't feel safe to go anywhere. Uh, and, and I'm grateful for that. I think if I had started talking about it too soon, I may have been locked up somewhere. And I know that happens as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, in my, um, just through a series of events, um, I was looking, paying attention, looking for help. And I wound up connecting with actually what was a potential handler sent in to help lock down. Um, but he was it's very convoluted. And I know I talk about this in the book, but it wound up him introducing me to these two men in Salt Lake City who had worked with someone else before me. Um, and the reason I was allowed to go by my handlers and controllers was because I had a kill program to one of the men that I would wind up working with. Um, and he, he would later validate that as well as myself. There would be evidence that that was true. Um, so really, I guess my programmers and handlers just really didn't realize that he and I were both still connected to spirit in some way that was stronger than, than the programming. So that began in, at 46 and I'm now 61 surprised I'm still alive. And now I realize that it was always intended to be that way from, from higher sources that I stay alive and, and get out. So that's kind of a synopsis of. Yeah. Wow. We're so, we're so grateful that you're here, Alyssa, and telling your story to, to help everyone, you know, both survivors and the general population who have also experienced so much mind control it was interesting how you were talking before about how you know your high connection to source was really kind of able to lead you through, you know, I guess breaking through um, the mind control. And even though handlers and technology, et cetera, were attempting you to drive you into you know, potentially assassinating um, someone, that connection to source was able to to, to lead you through another way and I guess that's the the whole preface behind mind control is you know these compartments that they're able to you know seg segment off through trauma-based um, programming program to do different things and then the front altars actually can't um, or don't necessarily have any knowledge of this whatsoever you yeah. know I had when I started um, what I call deep deep programming with these two and when I was 46 I had the better part of a decade missing. I mean, I, all I had was just blips, you know, but when, and I, I mean, there were strange things like um, people would ask me how old I was and I would have to internally count the years. I knew the year I was born, but I could never even retain that, you know, and there were a lot of those kinds of secrets. Like I was trying to 
look like everybody else. But at the same time, I couldn't have told you what what was actually happening. And when a lot of the memories surfaced, um, I didn't even have the language. I didn't even have the mind control language. So, um, for example, being, you know, um, remembering being on a military base, being worked over, I was being electroshocked and um, there was military in the room. And um, I remember my language was all I could, all I could manage was they were putting things in my head and taking things out. You know, I didn't even have the language for, yeah. and, and I was just absolutely baffled. I knew I was in a seriously dangerous situation, but I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why. And why would they want to put things in my head and take things out, you know? So there can be these really, I mean, there's, you probably know this, there's just these really bizarre memories that they're fragments. It's not like a movie where, you know, beginning through the middle to the end, um, what would happen would be um, an altar of mine would surface with a memory and it would just be a segment of whatever was taking place. Um, because a lot of my memories were there was one altar that it started with and then I was switched into another altar. So maybe the first altar didn't want to share anything, but the second altar did. So it was just a piece and a fragment um, of all these terrible situations and, and all these places that I'd never been in my front altar. You know, um, I, I had no memory of ever being there or I would take a trip in my front altar and then there'd be a bunch of missing time. And years later, I would discover that it wasn't my trip. It was them sending me to Egypt for something, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, and, and one of the things I wanna say about, um, and I know we'll get into some of this, but I was taken through, because of my age, I was taken through trauma-based mind control, which is it's from birth, if not from the womb. Um, I even believe in many cases, they bring people together to create a particular individual. So it can start really early. Um, it has been known to start in the womb. They can start traumatizing the, the child in the womb. Um, and, but the MKUltra that I'm referring to is that it's from birth on. Because of the timeline of my programming and use, I wound up also transitioning into uh, directed energy weapons, the remote programming and targeting, which occasionally is still going on. Um, it's kind of like a reminder, I believe, um, as far as they're concerned, I'll always be government property. So um, the remote technologies, you know, that's gonna happen now and then. It's just, there's no way around it. Um, they're always gonna outgun us. It's not about, Right now, it's not about shutting all this down. I don't think we have that, that level of power. What it is for me is gaining sovereignty. Um, and I know that word gets thrown around, but I think a lot of people don't really realize what it is. And I'll describe it from my perspective and my experience. And that is at some point in deep, deep program, and I do remember the moment I was being targeted you know, remotely and things were still happening, but we had moved out of, you know, them sending in handlers because none of it took and it would, they would try one then they try another, and you know, it would just go like that. And I never, I never really went with it. I knew what the, the operatives were when they came uh, and some of them were other mind control victims, which winds up um, you wind up doing what I call mutual handling that way. That's very common when an, an MK ultra starts waking up for them to send in another victim to have you engage with. Um, and at, I remember this, there was a, a, a lot of remote stuff going on at the time. It's not, it's not as frequent now. It's just here and there, but there were, it was pretty consecutive. And, um, and I remember the moment that I, one night, didn't have fear anymore. Something happened. And I remember sitting up in bed and this, just this, uh, the fear left, this strength came through me. And it was as if I said at that point, I'm now the watcher and I'm gonna be the observer. And you can't, you can't harm me anymore in the way that you want. Meaning I had regained, I see it now as I had regained my spirit and my soul. And 
I was no longer theirs, no matter what they think or believe or what they do. And it was very empowering, Gabby. It was, um, it Great was time. just, oh, it was, it was, I started recording everything and I started relaying it to um, a couple of people in my circle as if, and I would call it on the record. And I knew that it mattered now that I spoke about the very specific things I was experiencing um, and that there were other people that were probably experiencing the same. And if not, they were going to be. And it just, it shifted everything at that point. Um, losing the fear, I, I realized they want, they want us and need us to stay in the fear, to keep the programs running. Um, and this is a very spiritual thing. This is a very... Um, I mean, you're up against physical technology, you're up against physical people, but the, really at the crux of it is this very esoteric aspect where um, we have to learn to, um, through a series of things, um, we have to learn how to take back our will and engage that will. You know, um, we've, we can all see that our society has become um, rather powerless, um, disempowered. Uh, we don't use a lot of critical thinking across the board. I believe that the will has been disengaged for most people, meaning we have been trained and indoctrinated to just get up and do this and this and this and this, and then you go to bed and then you do it all over again tomorrow. That's not really any will engaged. You know, it's not a proactive empowered stance um and to me that's the key to deprogramming and i mean it, it takes us each what it takes to get to that point and i had been through a lot of a lot of disappointment in early deprogramming as a matter of fact i used to call it i had stepped from you know i had stepped into a minefield when i started deprogramming uh, because it became dangerous. It became consciously dangerous. It had always been dangerous, but now I was aware and seeing it around me. And there wasn't a safe place. There wasn't a place to go. There wasn't a, a community waiting to assist me. We haven't gotten to that point. Um, we really haven't gotten, there's a lot of support now because like your show and many other shows, people are willing to talk about it and, and bring it out into the open. But when I first started it, it, it's, it was scary, you know, and they sent people in and there were a couple episodes that two episodes in particular, I was very clear that um, they sent someone in to, to take me out. And mm -hmm. in those moments, I had guidance. I had warning prior to it getting too dangerous for me to be able to exit. And, um, and I don't know if that was divine inter intervention or, you know, if there's somebody sitting at a computer somewhere that, you know, warned me. Um, I really can't say, but I, I know in, in the last six months I had, uh, or last year, in, in the last year I had an episode and there's no question that it was divine intervention. Um, and they had again sent someone, uh, two men to me and I had forewarning. Um, and uh, so that was a real, I feel like that's there for all of us that we just really don't pay attention to it or we're not in a state of consciousness when we're under programming. It's really, it's really difficult to see that um, because there's, you know, I was running on full blown adrenaline yeah. most of my life you know I mean adrenal overload and burnout was one of the main symptoms I had to deal with um, you know when I started deprogramming but so it's really hard to see what is available or what is also helping you or protecting you along the way when it's just fear 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 which is in many ways what's happening on a global scale now yeah right? um it's, and, and I won't call what's happening on the global scale really MKUltra just yet because MKUltra victims are usually under total control and we haven't hit that yet. What we're under is indoctrination, targeting, 
which is uh, there is targeting, global targeting going on. Um, and it is a form of mind control, but I still think we're at a place where um, we can we can make a choice. I don't know how long that's going to last, Gabby. I honestly don't. Um, and I remember, what's that? Oh, they're definitely stepping it up. They're stepping it up. They really are. And I remember when I first started deep deprogramming, I had an altar that uh, she would just, she wanted to shout it from the rooftops to anybody who would listen. And what it was, was, you know, what they did to me is they're coming for all you now, all of you. I'm a microcosm of the macrocosm and they want total and utter control of environment, atmosphere, people, animals, everything. And I'm not saying they're going to succeed. I'm saying that is what they want. And I think it actually goes farther than that. They want more planetary sun control, the whole nine yards. Um, they want to control basically the entire solar system. And that's actually documented somewhere that, that they were talking about that. Um, but it doesn't mean they're going to succeed. And I think that's the pivotal moment we're at is yeah. which side are you on? What what do you choose? What are you going to do with your life? What, you know, what kind of questions are you going to start asking? Yeah. That kind of thing. So true. It's, it's just, we're at such a pivotal point in, you know, human consciousness evolution. And it's like, you know, what are we going to stand for? You can see so many individuals, you know, healing and rising up. And I know you speak a bit about this in your, your book as well. So eloquently, you know, that the work of the self and the work of really, you know, deprogramming ourselves you know whether you're an mk ultra survivor or you know you've been programmed by all the indoctrination and the propaganda you know we all need to come back to like working out you know what do i actually stand for what are my thoughts what do i feel and what you know what is my life going to be rather than you know like you said people are just you know just plodding along they're not asking questions just um you know following in line following in line following everyone else, following the politicians or, you know, the latest hit in the alternative media, you know, sp spilling out a little bit of truth but not really getting people to where they need to go. And, you know, I think that was such a beautiful way that you um, described it in your book that, you know, the work needs to be on ourselves first, on setting ourselves free. And then from that individual empowerment and sovereignty that you're talking about, then we create the communities of change and evolution that we really need like rather than people are kind of lost scared you know they're still under the fear programming and they're like I need I need others I need help and so they're sort of falling into you know they're following someone else it might not be a politician but they're following you know someone else rather than really doing the work for themselves and it was it was um you know interesting to hear what you were saying about you know from an MK survivor's point of view all the fear um programming kicking in you know when they send people to attack you when text used on you and it, it sort of you know, brings on this whole trauma circuit of you know disempowerment you know my life's threatened what can I do and it really shuts down you know our minds to you know all of the you know there's there's a, a million options of what you could do but in that state of fear you might only think of one or two because you're just like heart pumping out of your chest you probably went into an altar if you dissociate um and that's really how they control us so I would love to hear you know from your experience as a you know someone that's been um utilized in such a high level and by powerful people like what sort of triggers um you know we utilized on you so survivors can be aware of that with potential handlers or um you know technology coming into their lives yeah good question um most of the to really set me off into a particular altar would require several triggers in combination uh obviously because one trigger could get inadvertently sent off you know um somewhere where they're not in control of it but oftentimes it involved very specific words or phrases, um, eyes locked. The person that was setting me off locked eyes with me before delivering the phrase and often involved touch at the same time, a certain placement of hand or um, you know, what have you. So, and I think it's, it's really transitioned a lot. You know, there's old 
a series of programs that a lot of us had that have now been changed up. So I don't really know, you know, modern programs. Although if, if you're a 50s, 60s or 70s, it's likely that you'll have a lot of the, the similar stuff. Um, for me, there was clearly like, for example, in particular for me, there was clearly a pilot that was involved in certain programs. There was a lot of phrases um, uh, related to, to flying or, um, and then of course there were several helicopters that I recall being in that kind of thing. So um, it can be, it can be, there's a general across the board um, in alpha programming, beta programming, delta programming, you know, they go through the, the whole bit um, and they can be very similar across the board, but then there will be very specific individual depending on who your programmers were how many times you've been handed off to other people. Um, and then there's the aspect of, um, I'm very clear on this, that as you age, someone like me, um, there was intended use well, well, well into my older years. Um, it used to be where people talked about how at a certain age it was over and they'd be taken out. And that's not the case anymore. And it, I don't believe it's been the case for a long time because I have come across others that were sent in on me. Uh, one man in particular in deep deprogramming, um, he was sent in and he was a, he was still sharpshooter. He was in his seventies wow. and he was still competing sharpshooting. And um I believe I witnessed the end of his use, meaning um, my interaction with him and my cutting him off, and which would cut off his purpose of being in the town that I was in. Um, and they took him back to, uh, to a hospital. He told me he was going back to a hospital. And I was pretty sure that, because his programming was breaking down and his interactions with me, that that was now going to be the end of, you know, I don't know what happened to him or if he's still alive, but in other words, it was clear to me, they were pulling him from use. He was done. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really, so, I mean, he's, he was, yeah, he was 70 or 71 and he was still competing sharpshooting and winning. Um, so I think it really, first of all, it depends on your use. Uh, it depends on your longevity. Um, it depends on your programmers. But there's also another aspect to it. Um, I believe that what happens, like I don't believe I'm being um, attempted to control me or remotely attacked by the same people that I started with. I think as we age, what happens is I believe there's probably a market for selling us off to other people, kind of um, dropping you down on the, the hierarchy scale of, of, of a slave. Um, and you can wind up in some pretty bad situations that way. Um, I know of someone who was hooked on drugs and prostituted out. Um, I know for myself at some point, I got really clear when I was in deprogramming that I had been handed off or sold one of the two, and they were now experimenting remotely on me. Um, very particular programs. And I saw this aspect of, um, uh, it was like for roughly three, four months, I would have this thing going on remotely and then it would stop and then there'd be a short break. And then, you know, a month or so down the road, something else would start up. So I think there's a, even as you age and you become less useful to your original use, I think that you can be sold off once, twice, however many times. Um, and, and if you are, like I said earlier, if you are brought through, uh, government programs, military intelligence programs, um, it's, it's likely that there, there's no retirement, <laughs> you know, let's just put it that way. Um, you, if you gain your sovereignty, they can't continue to use you, but it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be, for example, remote attacks or, you know, some form of targeting or attempts to, to do that because, you know, my theory was many years ago and to some degree, I still feel the same once MKUltra, always MKUltra from their perspective. So that I, and I think it's important to, to take a look at that uh, because there are a lot of, there can be a lot of pitfalls in deep 
deprogramming. And they're going to, like with me, a lot of times what they do is when you start waking up, they flood you with memory. Um, I call it flooding. Um, I think they call it flooding too. And the, the idea is to overwhelm you and hope that you'll take yourself out for one, or you'll look absolutely insane and nobody's going to listen to you. Um, and it's, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, it was, I, I, I'm actually surprised, you know, I made it for, through the first couple of years. Um, I have memories of waking up and, you know, four and five self-destruct or suicide programs going off, you know, and having to just hold on really just to hold on. Cause I didn't have enough strength to have worked my way through it all yet. Um, but I, you know, back to the divine intervention, I, I recall over the years, I don't know that it was really a voice in my head. It was more just an understanding of comfort. This, it would say, just hang on, just hang on. Everything's going to change. Just hang on. Um, and so I did, you know, uh, for the most part, I mean, there were some really tough self-destruct situations over the years. Um, especially I think with the kill programming, you, you don't have the memory, the conscious memory of it, but what it's done to your spirit and your soul that you've done these things, um, wears you down, you know, over the years. So, um, and then now, of course, we've moved into whole new generations of, of what I would still call MKUltra, but it's remote technologies. Um, and honestly, Gabby, if, you know, if, if I was to lay out what I know about them right now, for the people that are just the average person, they would never believe that this is where we're at. Um, there are some really absolutely bizarre and incredible, um, awful, incredibly awful things going on for people that are, that are under this. And I do know of some people that were like me start, it started from birth. Um, and they are now, I know someone who's close to 70, who is used 24 mm seven -hmm. and it's all remotely done as far as I can see. I mean, there's, there's some people that come into his sphere and he recognizes them, but this is all being done um, at night in the astral. And um, yeah, it's, it's gotten pretty, it's gotten really wild. It's like a big sci-fi movie, um, but these are, these are real technologies and they are been in use for some time. And even for me, I had memories when I first started waking up that there wasn't a, when I was out on in an altar on task, there wasn't a physical handler presence mm -hmm. and I would still switch altars. And it, I didn't, again, didn't have the language of remote technologies, but that I believe for me that started in the late seventies, early eighties. So they, it's been around a long time. I mean, there were physical handlers, but there were times when I didn't apparently didn't even need handlers. And I attribute that now to, to remote technologies. Yeah, it's it's just incredible, like learning about this and speaking to survivors. And I've had my own experiences with the technology as well. And you, know, you go out and speak to someone that has no idea about MK Ultra or anything that's going on, and it, it's like science fiction, but it's becoming science fact. And you know, it's it's absolutely horrific and scary thinking how you know far how much further advanced you know the capabilities of the military of intelligence and corporations and you know religious institutions are compared to you know the 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 technology that's rolled out to the masses is just such a small part you know we always get it's always described as dual use so we get like this little bit like oh this is amazing for you and it's probably surveillance and tracking and then when you look at the other, it's like the hidden iceberg of what this technology actually does that the military's had access to. It's just um, just absolutely horrific. And it, it makes, I mean, it's, it surprises me that, you know, the technology was being used so many decades ago. And I think that we're, we're sort of just all thinking, oh, it's something quite recent. This is you know, it's being rolled out yeah. 4 and 5G, but this is decades and decades ago. And it, it makes so much sense that technology and frequency is being used as a trigger because so much of the programming is done under frequencies as well to access some um, parts of the minds with, you know, the alpha frequency, beta, delta, et cetera. 
Um, and yeah, exactly. as someone that's you know, that, how, how, how did you experience um, you know, a, a, te a tech trigger sort of coming through? Uh, different ways. Um, of course, I wasn't really um, acknowledging that when I was still under. Um, all I knew was I was switching altar. And I do remember having this one memory where I was switching altar on my own. And it's interesting because when I described it again, pre proper language, I described it as there was someone in the room with me, but it wasn't really, he wasn't really there. It, wow. Like in other words, there wasn't a physical person, but I felt someone in the room with me and I was switching altars. Um, so I think that had to do, you know, that was an example of remote technologies without me being able to describe it properly as well. I'm a big, big proponent, proponent of, um, there is no programming without the entities, the my Loveland entities. I'm a big, big proponent of that. And I know that was at least in the people from my generation and earlier, that was not really popular, but it is not at all just a case of them pretending that it is just to traumatize you. I have met these beings. I have interacted with these beings I on the astral. Um, they have been a significant part of my programming. So even with the technology, it is my uh, position that the entities ride the technology. Um, they ride the frequencies. And so it, they can gain access. You know, I'm sure you've talked about the subtle bodies, the, you know, the etheric body, the astral body and so forth. And when, when we've been traumatized, whether individually or en masse, those those subtle bodies get holes in them so to speak they get open in places and that's where entity attachment um happens and that's in my opinion a significant part of why there was trauma-based mind control because of what it opened the person to um as well it opened in my case i i know that it gave me insight into things beyond the physical realm which I believe was also desired by my programmers. And that continued into deep deprogramming. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, there is something that is um, tech called brain computer interface, very real and can create psychic abilities or clairvoyance that isn't actually psychic or clairvoyant, not in the true sense. So, so there's a combination of the trauma and torture can push you into um, can push you into some of these abilities. And for me, I never felt in control of them. They felt very random as if it was a byproduct. Um, and then there was also, I'm certain I know this for my, for myself due to something I saw in my mind's eye that I connected with on a remote attack one night that there was also brain computer interface. A lot of the things that are happening that happen to me on occasion, um, I'm absolutely certain are being AI generated that I'm hooked in as many, many people are. I mean, in, I would I would guess in the billions now are hooked into AI systems that may even not be aware of it. Um, so um, sorry, I was lose my train of thought. Um, so there's there's the remote aspect. I mean, there's a tech aspect. I call it esoteric science. That's mm -hmm. what I call it because there's a very occulted uh, spiritual aspect to it, and there's the physical technological aspect. And um, to me, they can't be separated. Not not in this day and age. I don't think they ever could. Even with trauma based mind control, I believe it was very a very esoteric, occulted practice of old ancient understandings of black magic and so forth. And that is still active today. And it's a part of the technology, whether you know those perpetrating it would acknowledge it or not is irrelevant. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's I, actually, I forget your, your question. <laughs> <laughs> what did you I ask me? I think, I, think, I think I went flying off on something that really there. well. Um, yeah, it's it's just incredible, like looking at how technology and it's really black magic have been meshed together, and you know, even with you know the creation of modern 
modern day MK Ultra, you know, in the 50s, 60s, you know, they were going back and utilizing older cult books like the Egyptian Book of the Dead. They had intelligence going out to like, you know, a whole lot of spiritual, um, spiritually advanced groups of people to take their knowledge and then weaponize it against us. So it's so interesting your experiences in the astral, you know, with these entities, with AI actually being present. And I think in your book, you actually was that the pink haze, the AI interface that you, um, no, no, I don't think so. I did mention something about a pink, but I think it was, uh, I, I labeled it more as an entity. Entity. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's really interesting. You would, you would mention this. They, you know, they come out on the surface with this technology. They start talking about things from a military or a medical perspective, right? It's either something they're going to do in the military 20 years down the road or or a medical practice that's going to save people from this disease and this dysfunction and this disability and the truth is those all of those things that they bring to the surface have already been utilized in the black on targeted individuals or mk ultras or both and and i want to just um i want to it's something that just just came across um just to give an idea of, you know, I don't know how many people have really looked at the technology aspect. And, and this is presented as some kind of future military thing, right? Um, but it's called WBAN is the acronym. It's Wireless Body Area Network. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read a couple of the things that they stated in this document. And it'll give you an idea of where we already are at. Um, it says multiple implantable Electronic sensors relay electronic signals of body and brain waves and brave brain waves to remote computers, and they can send queries and receive them back. Uh, uses cell phone uh, cell phones, towers, drones, planes, satellites, and embedded transmitters in buildings and vehicles and furniture. Um, and then the difference between two G, three G, four G. They, they only monitor one thing at a time, one, one at a time. 5G monitors a thousand at a time. That's the internet of things. Um, the system additionally can stimulate nerves, muscles, body organs for pain, vibrate, heat up or die, suffocate, choke, cramp, burn, or electrically rape, cause heart attack, stroke, and organ failure. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what, what we're talking about and what they want to do. This is this has been these documents have been out for some time, and these are the things they were striving for. Um, and you know, it's said in many circles. Okay, the above ground technology, the below ground technology is probably fifty years ahead. I personally believe it's farther than that. I really do. And when you think of technology, you have to think of it in terms of how once technology presents itself, how fast and rapidly it starts to increase. You know, what, what technology did in, in a 10 year span, the increase, you know, 40 years ago is not the same amount of increase now when we've got AI systems Exponential. that are running themselves. I mean, they really are running themselves now. We're, we're already there. You know, and and maybe just a couple of um, I got this from Lookout for Charlie. That's the name of his site, Lookout for Charlie. He does some great work um, and he calls these ascension sy symptoms. Mm -hmm. What they really are, are, as he says, are uh, radio frequency weapons. And these are just some maybe for some of your listeners, uh, skin issues. And it doesn't mean if you have one or two of them that, that you you're a victim. But I read this list to a radio show host the other day, and he told me he had all of them. Um, he's, he's suffering too. So skin issues like dry or a film or open sores, hair loss, itching, burning, arthritis symptoms, neck pain, clicking, popping of joints, jaw and neck, narcolepsy and insomnia, arguing, talking in sleep, limb movement during sleep, hearing noises, seeing flashing lights, inner ear issues, pressure, tones, tinnitus, voices, sinus popping, muscle cramps, cysts along the lymphatic system, dizzy, lightheaded vertigo, um, and I would add to this hot flashes. 
uh, beyond menopause, way beyond menopause. Um, and I know of a couple other women that experience internal heat, like hot flashes that just come on that are way past menopause. Um, and I would, I would suggest that this is uh, evidence of the RF weapons, maybe even microwave, you know, in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, it's so concerning just, you know, like re hearing those symptoms, it's things that, you know, people, you know, in the new age movement are like, oh, you know, these are your Ascension symptoms. Um, <laughs> you know, the new age, exactly, you know, the agendas of the new age movement and actually bringing in this technology and getting people to accept it, you know, as a positive thing with all the smart, you know, computers on, on their bodies and Fitbits and the whole lot. So yeah, it's just um, just such it's multi-dimensional warfare, really, isn't it? And it really is. It really is. And and I mean, I, in the book, I talk about, as you know, I talk about some more in-depth um, aspects of um, of where things are at regarding things such as cloning, um, uh, REM, which is um, rapid eye movement cloning when you hit a certain stage of sleep and um, there's, they're pulling astral bodies um, from individuals. And uh, I mean, this is real, this is actually happening. I, I've had my own experiences with this um, years ago, not anymore. For some reason, I don't seem to be on that list, thankfully. Um, but I do know individuals who are living this um, nightly. Um, so there, I mean, it has really evolved from, you know, people needing to just understand that there's surveillance or that their cell phone, their smartphone is a weapon with a phased array antenna in it, which is the same thing as a harp antenna. Uh, you got a mini, mini phased array antenna in there. And I think people should start asking themselves why they would have a phased array antenna in their cell phone. Um, a friend of mine said to me, well, you, you know, you go on your laptop and I said, yes, but my laptop wasn't designed as a weapon. The smartphone was, it was designed to be a weapon. Um, and now it's become a convenience for people. So, and I know you've talked with Ilana Freeland. She's a friend of mine and, um, I know no one better to, to look to for information on the technologies and, um, and in fact, not in theory by Alana, she documents her work. Um, there are tons of footnotes in her books um, with the documents to prove it. So um, we're, we're at this point where, like I said, I don't, they haven't gained total control over the global populace, but that is where they wanna go. So now's the time. And when, when this pandemic hit, um, when this hit, I knew that we were at, uh, we were at what I call the next level of what I refer to and, um, had of my own end time programming, meaning not that things are going to end ap apocalyptically right now. I'm not talking about that, but end time programming, um, there's several levels to it. And to me, that's when they start creating, um, um, on the surface chaos and uh, they're they're heading for uh, the global populace. So uh, I believe that the pandemic was the beginning of that level now. Um, I saw that very clearly. What shocked me, and I'm sure it shocked a lot of us, was how many people have fallen for it and continue to fall for it. Um, it's, it's frightening. And of course you probably know as many of us do what's taking place as a result of, of that so-called jab, um, what's taking a place as a result of many, many, way too many people receiving that. And it's not being reported properly. Um, it's you can find information on that in alternative, but you won't find it in mainstream media. And the numbers are staggeringly high and it's going to continue like this, you know, because people are still going back to get another one and then another one. Um, and I don't know about your community, but in, you know, I'm in a different state than I was just 
a couple of weeks ago, but in both states, um, there's still a lot of people wearing masks that are not required to wear one, a lot of people. And what's really concerning to me is how many of those are young people. Yeah. I, I kind of understand how older people who think they might, you know, get sick, they don't understand things, but the younger generation is on board with this, a lot of them. And that is, right. is frightening. And, and I attribute that to them being raised on tech. Yeah. Um, you know, tech, what we're doing right now, this is the way I see it. I know what I'm dealing with when I get on a computer. I, I, I have a, a sovereignty about me that when I go on to do good works, which is what we're doing and what <laughs> a lot of people are doing across the globe, that's a whole different deal. But to go on it unconsciously okay. and become addicted to it and to not really, I mean, I, I see um, social interaction um, lack of eye contact, um, like when I go in a store or a restaurant or whatever, um, there's a certain age that it's, it's, I experienced it recently here. I've only been here a couple of days and a pleasant person, but he can't look me in the eye. I mean, it's just a, a, young, a young person. He can't look in the eye and he seems um, almost automatic on autopilot. You know, um, and I'm seeing this more and more. I think a lot of us are. And that's concerning because the agenda of that transhumanist, which is the ultimate of mind control and body control, the transhumanist agenda, is really to remove that human spirit and, and soul from people. And in some cases, I see people are already have already walked in the door for that. You know, it's already having an effect. And that doesn't mean it's it's going to succeed for, you know, the entire human populace. I personally don't believe it will. I, I believe there are a lot of people that are going to go down that road. They're going to continue to choose to go down that road. But I also know there's a, a huge segment of the population or a segment of the population that oh, is, yeah. we're not falling for it. We're not, you know, and push come to shove. We'll do whatever we have to do to remain human. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I learned in my journey that, um, yes, I want to stay around. I want to do good works. Uh, this is what's important to me. I want to learn more about the truth, which is my study of Rudolf Steiner. And I'm a novice student, but he's a critical part. His information is a critical part of my healing. Um, but at the same time, I reached that point. I had to reach that point in deprogramming where, um, it doesn't matter if they try to kill me. It doesn't matter anymore. The most important thing, it doesn't matter how long I'm here. The most important thing is the quality of what I do and have while I'm here. And there's just, as we all know, there's just um, certain things I'm not going to consent to, or I'm not going to compromise to, um, you know, I don't have a, a stationary place. So I don't have a landline, so I, but I have a flip phone and I refuse to get, I use it and turn it on when I need it. And I refuse to get a, a smartphone, you know, um, because I know what it is and I know what they're doing with it. And I have a lot of people I know that, that do have them. And in a couple of cases over the last couple of years, I've seen some shifts in, in their, consciousness or behavior um not so drastic that it's you know terrifying but they seem to think they can't be influenced by it that they're above that and um i i'm just not convinced that's that's so um i guess if they've really reached a super super state of of, of sovereignty maybe that's true but you know, even being around some of my friends that have one, I've, I've said them to once in a while, we'll be meeting for a cup or something. I go, you realize when the phone's sitting on the table. So you realize by having that sitting there, I'm now getting hit by the same frequencies that you are. You know, um, just walking around in the world, we're walking in between all these people and there are frequencies and we're, we're all getting hit by it. You know, whether it's a brief moment or, or, um, you know, long-term, 
Um, but I would just love to see, I would love to see everybody just take a, how about we all just take a break from a smartphone for six months? And that see be amazing? How, wouldn't it? <laughs> see how you feel. Just see how you feel and, and what could your energy's like and what your thoughts are. And, you know, everybody take the battery out and let's just see how the world feels again without that. Because the towers aren't going to be sending the freak. There won't be anything. Well, of course, we're all loaded with nanotech now. So who knows? Maybe we don't even need the smartphone anymore. But, um, you know, it's in all of us. I'm sure you know that with the chemtrails. And, exactly. and I, look at, I look at the jab as, you know, chemtrails on steroids. Yeah. That's what I, you know, that's what I look at it as. It's like the, the most concentrated way to get it in to somebody, but that we've all been exposed to a lot of the same things that, you know, for, for decades it's in there. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm an extremely, you know, this from the book, I'm a very hopeful person. I mean, not even hopeful. I have tremendous faith. Yeah. And, and a lot of that comes through the development of my inner life not the MK Ultra version, but the the anthroposophy. And um, I see it just as this is a terribly challenging, there are horrific things going on in this time. And at the same time, this is an opportunity, yeah. you know? Um, and even in the spirit world, I mean, the the presentation of evil was so that we have the opportunity to choose the right and the good yeah. that is i get goosebumps whenever i think about that 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 is really it and and in that respect we are now in a time where we get to choose we get to choose do we want to ask the important questions and develop our inner life and become true sovereign beings with a will that we can engage and think outside the box because they're presenting all the options. You yeah. know, you may think you're rebelling by choosing that thing, but they created that one too. <laughs> you, know? you know, I mean, Joyce, I obey. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. Are we really are we really choosing for ourselves? You know, what what does that look like in this day and age? What would that look like if we were really choosing for ourselves? Um and, and it's a process, it's not an event, you know, it's, and it's daily, you get to do it over and over. You know, I, I often hit hard times, you know, or I feel down too, and, and, and I know what's going on. And um, like with your, your perspective of, you know, with the children, I mean, that's devastating at times. I mean, sometimes I wake up and it's the first thing that pops in my mind is what's happening to the kids. And it, it's, you know, it's hard, but I have to recommit. I just recommit every time that, no, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to make sure people know about it, but I'm not going to stay in that emotion of how that feels. And as I'm, I'm guessing, um, I'm putting this on to you, but the way I feel about it with the kids is that, first of all, most people have no idea what's happening globally and has been for eons regarding kids and it's still going on underground and as far as the surface society it is my contention that no matter what good deed we do if we don't address what's happening with the children the society will continue to devolve and that is what we're witnessing is a devolution of society. And to me, the thing that feeds that is the torture, trauma, rape, murder of children. And until, and I think, I mean, it's not happening now. We're talking about it. We're not there yet because it's still going on. I had a lovely young man in the other state I was just in sit down and tell me that um, his, in his terms, why MKUltra was over and when it stopped. And I had to illuminate him and, um, and he listened, it was beautiful. He really listened. He kept coming back for more. Um, it, and he wept at first, he wept. And I said, because I said, not only is it not over, 
it has transitioned into a mind blowing level, you know? So, and that's where we're at in we're, we're all responsible. That's a really hard one to take. How can I be responsible with what's happening to a child somewhere across the world? Our complacency, our acquiescence, our not wanting to look or acknowledge it. There's a very, very potent energy that happens when a person sincerely acknowledges that this is real and that on some level we're all responsible that it's here and it's 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 successful for the dark ones as it is you know that alone can start to change things which is why i'm sure you're doing what you're doing and i'm doing what i'm doing and so many other people are doing this you know but to sincerely stop looking away and i know it's terribly uncomfortable and heart-wrenching to know what is really happening in the world but the good news is on the when you get in and you face that darkness there's another side to it and i say that when you go through it you actually for the very first time on the other side become empowered so become able to do and uh, function in a way that you never had before that you were unaware of that you weren't even functioning that way you know um so i encourage people and i'm not just saying overload yourself with information i'm saying take it in, in a way and process it in a way that allows you to be fully human yeah you know fully human isn't that what we have to do now we have to be we have to work at being human now <laughs> right we've been with programmed what we're up to be the opposite. <laughs> wow you know how do we retain our humanity wow I hadn't thought about that one you know before I haven't had to but that's what the world of the globalists is pushing on us is we've got to remain human it. And that's our biggest strength, isn't it? To really define what it is to be human and hold on to that tight, guard that. And I love, you know, I love that, you know, you're talking about people being able to move through their fear and, you know, it's really facing that darkness, isn't it? That darkness that we firstly see in the world. We're like, oh, that's evil that's out there. And then reflecting like, you know, what have I done? What haven't I done? You know, how long did I look away for? And understanding that journey as well and it's it's so true I feel like you know individually and collectively we're facing our shadow and it's it's tough work tough work indeed now I was going to ask you Alyssa yeah. I know that you um experienced being um trafficked on um being used as an asset within religious uh, religious context as well and I think that's often the most shocking for a lot of people like here in Australia we've had this kind of um this kind of programming occurring through um our church institutions pentecostal churches um you know various religious institutions have even set up care programs that work within our mental health system and really target um survivors coming in to try and get help to reprogram them so it's just terrific so i would love to hear you know what your experience was um so we can understand that better too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, um, most or many religious institutions have long been infiltrated. And I personally believe that began like hundreds of years ago, or if not longer. But now it's in this version where, um, I mean, a lot of the locations of the churches and so forth are even being used for abuse, trauma, and programming. Um, so, and, and, and honestly, Gabby, I see that I'm, I'm a, being a, a student of Rudolf Steiner. I'm, um, I, I look at it as what, what he calls the Christ impulse. Um, the Christ that was manifest in man more than 2000 years ago and now is is manifest in um what he calls an impulse and a 
the etheric, the etheric, it's here, it's, it's still, it's still with us. Um, and I see that that attack on religious institutions, even though they were more of a exoteric Christianity, uh, that's how I see religion, most religion, um, as opposed to what I look at Steiner as an esoteric Christianity. Um, but I see that there was an intended agenda to destroy, attempt to destroy any good that was found in those churches. Um, and I, I believe anybody can find their way to what I refer to as, or what Steiner refers to as the Christ impulse, even through sitting in sermons in church. I mean, it happens all the time. People find their way to the right way. Um, but I, so I think there was an attack on all of those institutions uh, filtering down from very dark entities that are influencing this world through people that were then, um, you know, in these institutions. Um, and so that there's an attack on the whole idea of Christ. And gosh, 10 years ago, I said, mark my words, it will be subversive to yeah. say Christ yeah. in a number of years. Getting that. Um, right. And aren't we kind of there? I mean, people roll their eyes and, yeah. you know, shut you down. Like that's some old out of date concept. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I see it happening. Uh, I see forms of persecution happening for, for speaking of things like that now. So my involvement, I wasn't um, like raised as a member of a church. What, and I, I haven't said this a lot, I leave it to the books, but I, I'll go ahead and say it here. I was utilized, I believe through uh, CIA, maybe FBI connections. I was utilized by high levels of the Mormon LDS church. So that's Latter-day Saints. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, excuse me, in my understanding is um, membership is growing astronomically worldwide for that church. So now I'm not saying the congregation, but I was programmed and utilized, even programmed um, with that members of that hierarchy at the higher levels. So um, yeah, and we know, you know, we've heard so much about the Catholic church, um, but it, you're right. It filters down into all denominations. Um, but I think um, those two churches, the one I mentioned and the Catholic, I mean, I think those are uh, deeply, deeply involved on, um, on a high level member basis. I mean, really deeply involved as in deeply involved with intelligence agencies, and military intelligence with this as well as, you know, it's gone very much gone corporate now. I mean, the, the military industrial complex, as we refer to it, we're talking about military contractors. They're a huge part of this, um, particularly in the sense of targeting, um, you know, as far as uh, mass targeting, targeting in individuals and communities and so forth. So, and those technologies, but, you know, at the, we have to remember at the heart of what they, maybe once were or intended to be is something um, something really beautiful and good and can be developed in our inner life on an individual basis if need be. That's so beautiful, Alyssa. And I think that's the journey because, you know, I, I know I um, experienced within a church when I was growing up some altar boys being abused and that had no memories of my own abuse within a church which have been coming back recently but that made me react so badly that you know I threw out the church I threw out all of it like because I was just like this is so corrupt and you know these people are complete hypocrites like they're abusing children and I think that's it's coming full circle and realizing that these institutions were, you know, sometimes set up, but also infiltrated to really take away our inner world. And you don't need those four walls and, you know, anyone else, you can have that connection to creator, to, you know, your higher self and really build that. And I think that's so important. And I know, I know um, reading your book through your healing journey, 
being able to connect and, you know, be guided by something bigger, you know, through these tough times is so, so important. And it's so essential with, you know, us all deprogramming at the moment is, you know, no longer needing a third party. We don't need to go through a church or anyone else, a priest, et cetera. Like you can have that connection yourself. And I'd love, I'd love to ask, you know, for, for the many survivors that are going to be listening to this, in terms of you know your work with deprogramming and connecting to your higher self and finding that guidance, you know to assist and support you, what sort of advice would you have or some tips that you could pass on to people? Because we have more survivors than ever remembering at the moment, in particular around programming, and I, I think you've done. You've just done this incredible job, you know, even reading your book, we can see at the start, you know, you were still considering yourself very much as like the parts and, you know, as um, someone that was living through, you know, multiple personalities. And it was beautiful to see, you know, over the years that that's really come back into you finding your wholeness. I thought that was just um, so magical. Thank you. Yeah. Gosh, um, depending on, you know, if you're MK Ultra from, from birth, um, there you start waking up they're going to send people that's the first thing I like to say they're going to send people okay um, they're going to want you to get into a relationship with someone or um, they're going to send someone that you've always wanted whether you didn't have the right father they'll send the father figure if you didn't have the right mother they'll send the mother figure if, if you haven't had the right lover they're going to send the perfect partner you know, and they'll keep trying, you know, when I turned away, they would send somebody else. And then I remember the moment they changed it, they went from the lover aspect to the fatherly figure, you know, and, and so that's one of the things is, you know, they're going to try to send someone in your, your mind isn't going to be clear for a while. You know, you just kind of have to white knuckle it, hang on and through it. Um, you may have flooding, um, there may be lots of altars. Once they think it's safe for them to show up, which is what happened for me, it just became overwhelming. I had to buy a little cassette recorder, a little hand recorder, because things were happening all night long. And I, I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. So I would record it and then just go back to whatever state of rest I was in. Um, journaling is extremely important. Um, because what's going to happen is it's going to be fragments and this is going to go on possibly for a very long time. And the fragments will feel scattered and dis disjointed unless you start recording it. And I remember in the first year when I first started seeing patterns or able, I was able to connect things up and they started to make sense. And that helped my mind start to clear um, and very important, very important to be able to put the pieces together, not just have a bunch of fragments because it's kind of like the personality. If it stays in fragments and nothing connects up, then you stay fragmented. Um, and with that recognition of me being able to put, start to put pieces together, and it even seemed to assist my altars in that as I began to take that responsibility, they seemed to feel safer to reveal. And, and I want to say I had a lot of dark, what I call dark altars, obviously, with kill programming, um, ritual altars. And ultimately, it took me a long time to realize, but ultimately, even they wanted out. They didn't. You know, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine, but it felt like even they on some level didn't want to be what they were. Um, and, but it was, it was challenging to face them. It was challenging to allow their memories. And there were cases where I just said, I can't do it. I can't do it today. I can't do it tomorrow. Um, I just, you know, not to overload yourself, to, to pace yourself. I'm not a believer in deprogrammers simply just personally um, because I, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for reprogramming there. And my view has always been, you know, unless somebody shows up that has had a change of heart and found Christ or, or what, and came out of my programming circles with a book loaded with all my codes and systems and altars, 
I mean, really, who's going to have that? Who who out there in the world is going to have that? Um, we're going to have that. Yeah. You know, each yeah. of us, yeah. if we can get to it, which is a real trick, but I mean, if we can get there, those things will start organically happening. Um, and a lot of prayer, honestly, a lot of prayer. I didn't even believe a lot of the stuff I prayed. Um, someone told me, just do it and know that I know it'll work for you. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I did, you know, um, I actually had a lot of aversion to Jesus or Christ or angels or anything. And I think that was part of the programming, quite honestly, to keep me away. Yeah. But eventually, once I found my way to St Rudolf Steiner, um, he was describing things I had encountered. And that was easier for me. Um, and now that's a significant part of my life, but there are very practical things you can do. Um, it's going to be hard to trust someone. If you just have, like in my case, I didn't have deep programmers, but I had a man who listened to everything I needed to say for a good year and a half. I would fill his voicemail <laughs> and I would keep calling until he emptied it. And then I would fill it again, you know, and every once in a while we'd be able to talk. And he, he promised me, he said, just know that I may not be able to answer, but I will listen to everything you have to say. And I needed that. I just needed someone to hear me. And it helped because it's a tremendous pressure that builds up. Um, and you've got all this stuff happening. You've got all this, these crazy self-destruct suicide programs possibly going off. Um, and you're dealing with overload of horrific memories um, and programming sessions and things you've done. For me, it was things I had done that were overwhelming. Um, and I've come to a place of understanding that don't worry about, you know, shame and guilt was a big block for, for deprogramming. Lots of shame and guilt. Um, you know, why we deserve this, what do we do to deserve this? Why did we do the things we did with enthusiasm in some cases? Um, and, and I found that once I started releasing that true healing could begin, but taking responsibility for that was huge for me, not saying, oh, well, I couldn't help it. Yeah. That's true. That's true. There was an involuntary act there. Yeah. However, on some level, I was present. Yeah. My body was present. A piece of my mind was present. I was there. And I remember the moment that I took responsibility for that. That was when true healing began for me, that I was responsible on some level. And now I need to be responsible for my own healing. Um, and I believe it's a lifetime, lifetime thing. I mean, I don't have tons of memory surfacing anymore. You know, I've got what I've got. You don't have to remember everything and every action. And um, it's really a matter of if you are MPD, if you've got alternate personalities, gently and with patience, allowing them to present themselves. Um, and and sometimes for me, the an altar would come up and just, I mean, it... <sighs> It would just she just wanted to show me over and over and over for a month, yeah. you know, until she was satisfied that I had reached whatever point I needed to reach with it. So it's it's not easy. Um, it's not an easy path, but um, it's a, a tremendously rewarding one. And the moment that I move was able to move from the concern for myself and 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 my well being to the point of my concern for humanity and humanity's well-being was a tremendous, tremendous place to move into. And it took time, it took years to get there. And, um, and so I guess what I'm saying is it's a, it's a challenging journey. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the book, very specific that you can do. And I talk about do's and don'ts and, um, internal programming and external programming and, and those kinds of things. But um, the other side of it is, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not living some outrageous life with lots of money and homes and that kind of thing. What I'm living is a life I, I really never imagined I could, which is sovereignty of mind and spirit and soul. 
And um, to be able to do this work um, is tremendously rewarding. And it, it's not about saving the world. It's just about, um, this is what I'm here to do. This is, I really don't, it's not like so virtuous. It's, it's more like, this is what I'm here to do was to get through this and do this. So get busy. That's more of how it feels, you know, rather than, oh, wow, this is so wonderful that you do this. It's, it's more like, what else would I do? What else could I do? You know, this is, this is what's intended. And I think you're right in that there are so many people waking up and i personally believe we're in the billions not millions wow think about that you know but so many people waking up and what what power that can have in the world um you know if if we can really really do this with sincerity and discipline and and um become sovereign what what even like butterfly effect you know does that have going out into the world if if a bunch of people genuinely regain their sovereignty, I um, think on a spiritual level that that can be incredibly potent. Absolutely. And wouldn't that be just the ultimate example that it's possible for everyone to have billions of mind control slaves oh. joining and being able to speak out, being able to share their story and bring the truth you know that to me that there's nothing that could stop that so yeah i see and that truth <laughs> yeah true truth, you know truth to me truth is one of the greatest acts of love and it doesn't mean it's going to be soft and comfortable and it, it's, it's not meant to be an attack or a front it's just speaking the truth is like we're 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 affecting everyone by speaking the truth right um, to the best of our ability, speaking the truth to the best of our ability of what we know today. And, and um, yes, I think it's one of the greatest acts of love that there is, but not necessarily easy. <laughs> <laughs> not much worthwhile that's easy in this place. I tell you. Right? <laughs> I agree to do this. <laughs> <Someday>. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, another really beautiful, um, you know, method of healing that I found in Alyssa's book is her collages, and mm. I think they're still online for people to go in, go in and check out. I might pop some f um, pictures, but um, at the end of this video too. But Great. they are so beautiful and so in depth, and I'd love you to speak just a little bit into how you um brought them together. But they're just you know allowing different altars to come through and you know, say what they need to say. And, you know, at, at the start, potentially of your remembering process, I think, you know, whether it's art or journaling or, you know, I had never thought of collages, but I just think, wow, that's so great because you could just grab a word or a picture. Um, so, yeah, I'd love love to hear what that process was for you when you were actually doing them. It was, it was profound, Gabby, and it lasted the process of healing. I mean, they were such an integral part of my healing. Um, and, that lasted for years. I, I have, you know, these books, like a scrapbook of them. And over the first five, six years, I would just occasionally go back in and open them up. And sometimes it was like a whole new piece was revealed out of a collage that I had never found before. Mm -hmm. And the way it started was I asked the altars to engage with me in this, that um, I would leave it to them and I wouldn't ask them any questions. No one would ask them any questions about what they revealed or anything. And I just made this kind of overall invitation. And I began um, by going to like a library where people would drop off magazines and all kinds of things. And um, I just started grabbing all these magazines and then I would go home and I would start, I would start cutting cutting things out. And I remember cutting things out and thinking, well, why on earth are you cutting that out? I mean, it doesn't mean anything to me, you know? And I literally had thousands of cut out pieces. And I, I was, I didn't even have a place at the time. And um, I would house it and I would go to people's houses and they'd leave. And then I'd find a big table and I'd lay everything out. And I'd take one, you know, piece from the scrapbook and I'd set it down and, and just say, okay, you know, and I'd start picking things up and I had my little glue and, and it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing what 
came to be, I think there's, is it 35 or 36 of them in there? And um, they were done in two different sections. There was one first section and then there was a second go um, sometime later. And um, in some cases, as in one of them, um, it was a very dark altar. She's very scary to me or was not anymore, but, um, and I invited her to, to do this very particular collage that was um, in regards to like a kill program to a person, the one I mentioned earlier. And what came out was just stunning. And it, I even wrote, it was the only one I wrote down in the corner that she had assisted me with it and wrote her name. Um, and, um, but it, it, that's the way they came together. I, on my own, couldn't have done this, you know, and it gave my altars the opportunity to express in a safe, confined environment. You know, that's the other thing for me with dark, really dark altars, I had to be careful of, you know, what I allowed them to come forward and do. And you've probably read some of the things in the book that early on were challenging experiences where it felt like they took over for a period of time. And that was very frightening. Um, so I had to temper it, but with the collages, it was, it was a, definitely a group effort. And I'm, I'm very grateful because it, it truly did reveal things that I couldn't get to in another way. Um, you know, it's kind of like those things they talk about, you know, if you're right-handed, right with your left hand or, you know, tapping into the subconscious, so to speak. And for me, it was a way of tapping into programming that I, I couldn't seem to access on another level. Highly recommend it. Very potent. And apparently I had a friend who, uh, still have a friend who years ago said, you know, send me the online, the color collages. And she went through them and said, holy cow, she said it was triggering all kinds of stuff in her too. So, you know, uh, really bringing up stuff she hadn't been able to think of before. So yeah, I highly recommend it. Incredible. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for sharing and for everything you do. You know, I, I um, you know, highly recommend everyone to read your book, you know, especially survivors of ritual abuse and mk ultra and i'll pop the details um, of where you can find that in the description box um it's just just such an incredible way for us all to deprogram you know whether you have are a survivor or you've just been indoctrinated i think you know there's so much we can learn from these stories and i just i love that idea of just you know so many survivors now healing and coming forward to speak now you know that's that's a future that i see and putting yeah. out there and working towards we can do that keep it keep it human <laughs> was yeah. there something you'd like to finish um with Alyssa no I just um thank you for what you do and um no it's really it's important to have you know a format where where people can come and speak and it takes courage and it takes a strong will to do that it's not an easy thing to do and thank you for that and I just want to say to everyone out there, you know, you're not alone more than ever. You are so not alone, even though this can make you feel completely alone and isolated. It's not true. Um, and, and if nothing else, um, start with prayer and just come up with your own, you know, start with prayer, ask for help. And I'm telling you, it shows up. It does. Maybe not exactly when you think it should but it <laughs> show exactly when it needs to be so blessings to everybody out there and thank you again Gabby oh, you are so welcome I love I love finishing on that too it's really you know us remembering you know that hope and faith can move so much if we just open the door